All right, so at least we have uh, the Zoom meeting working and uh, we can record. Yeah, I join the Zoom so remind me the number. I'll just, I'll just cut the beginning of it so that it's clean. Okay. Okay, uh, let me share my screen again. Thanks everyone for your patience. Um, okay. okay, so let me introduce you first. Yeah. Okay. okay, hello everyone. So due to some technical problems, uh, we will have the meetings mainly on Zoom and uh, unfortunately you guys will have to survive with my very little screen over here. So uh, today we will have our very own Charlotte Atten well, as a speaker of our algebra logic seminar. Uh, her title is Monoid Representations and Partitions. Okay, yeah, and sorry about the, the feedback, but um, yeah. Uh, okay, so I think maybe for afterwards, if you, you don't have, you probably don't have to turn your sound on to yeah, I could close my, I mute myself. Oh, okay. So, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry about that. So, um, yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for your patience. Uh, we have kind of an awkward situation here where I'm going to write stuff from my slides while I share my slides on Zoom because for some reason we're having a hard time connecting to the screen in here, but that's okay. So then hopefully there will be some kind of reasonable recording after this. Oh, I dropped my little clicker. Uh, so, uh, hopefully there will be some kind of reasonable recording after this, and it will still be um, good enough to follow uh, on both things. Oh, okay. Well, now I guess maybe we don't have Nick on on Zoom anymore. All right. Anyway. Um, no, oh no, he's, he's, still there. he's, he's back. Still there. Okay, I see. Yeah. Um. All right. So yeah, I want to talk about uh, monoid representations and partitions, and so. Uh, today I'll discuss how I came across this very long formula, which I will. Um. I will write over here, I guess. Yeah, and, I can um, address the camera. Right okay, here. but I mean, in the recording, right? Because I'm sharing, you can see the, the yeah, slides. Yeah. So then it doesn't matter if they, for at least for this part, it doesn't matter if people can see what I'm writing on the board. Um, okay, so I came across the following formula uh, when I was uh, my first or second year of grad school, maybe. Oh, I better give myself room. Okay. I'm going to just try to write this once and then leave it up because it's going to take a very long time to write it. Because of course it has to be a talk where there's going to be some long complicated formula that I have to write down and I can't use technology. So, okay. So the nth partition number is actually uh, one over n factorial times the sum over some set, which I'll explain what it is later. And that's really the, where the rub is and uh, times some, some, uh, some sort of heinous summation, which is over the product from uh, k equals one to n of, uh, let's see, k minus one factorial raised to the g of k, which I'll explain again what that is later, uh, times uh, g of k factorial. All right, and then the product continues. I just want to have it over to the side so I can write other things uh, throughout the talk, uh, times um, n minus the sum from s equals one to k minus one uh, of s times g of s. Uh, that quantity choose g of k. Uh, and then, all right, and then uh, times, we're still inside of the, the outer summation here, uh, times the product from uh, v equals one to g of k. Uh, and then well, we have our last binomial coefficient, which I will try valiantly to cram into the side here. Uh, so it's n minus the summation from s equals 1 to k minus 1, uh, s times g of s minus g of k uh, minus v minus 1 times k minus 1. So that quantity choose k minus one. Okay, and then this is the outer parentheses. So it's the summation over those. All right, so that probably maybe doesn't look uh, super, super appealing, um, but uh, the nice thing here, maybe I'll, I'll put the camera on myself. You're actually camera, it's actually you are using the camera. Oh, the... it was, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, oh, that's yeah. fine, I can I can maybe switch the camera. Yeah, switch the camera, that would be easy. Uh, Okay, let me stop sharing for a sec then and switch my camera. Uh, uh, I think you should actually keep the video part. 
what part? Yeah, you share your screen first, and then, and I, then it's actually this part. Yeah, I, I got it. There. I already yeah, did yeah. it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. All right. Cool. So, uh, yes, here now I can have it follow me around. So, uh, yeah, I can I can adjust it. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Just so I can have myself in the frame while talking. Uh. Okay. So. Yeah, and I'm recording still good. All right. Mm -hmm. So. This is the formula. Um, okay, why would I like this? It's some long, complicated formula. Well, there's a long history, which I actually don't know all the details of since I just discovered this incidentally, not while I was trying to find something about the partition numbers. And so there are a bunch of different formulas that uh, allow you to express the partition numbers um, in different ways. And they're usually, you know, these, these very like infinite constructions, right? But you can do it. Uh, but uh, there's no known elementary formula that just involves the partition numbers and um, just familiar functions, you know, like taken binomial coefficients, factorials, and so forth, um, that somehow relates the partition numbers or allows you to compute them. Um, this also is not such a formula, but it is interestingly close uh, in the sense that uh, this is saying the nth partition number is this kind of average of whatever these guys are, and these, as you can see, all involve elementary operations, except for one possibly interesting summation, uh, which is whatever this set of functions g is, or v of v sub n, whatever these g's are. And so this is at least somehow close to such an elementary formula. And um, as I'll maybe talk about more at the end, uh, actually, at least at this point, I've started getting in touch with people who are more experts on, on this exact sort of thing, but, um, I, I don't really know at the moment what an actual rigorous definition of what does or does not constitute an elementary formula is. So it's possible, um, for instance, because I haven't yet talked to someone, I've been talking to like one grad student who reached out to me who, who does partitions and I have another person I'm supposed to email that just haven't yet. But for all I know, I mean, even like having a formula that was like this maybe was not something which was known where like this means like over some you know, reason, reasonably not cheating uh, some like set of uh, functions. But again, I've never seen a rigorous definition of what would constitute an elementary formula for the partition numbers, just that no elementary formula is known or believed to exist. So, okay, um, so can you explain what's your VF? Yeah, yeah, so that's the whole talk. Yeah, okay. um, all right, so, and then feel free to ask questions, of course. Okay, so, I'll just leave this up throughout the whole talk, um, on the board at least, and on the slides. Uh, well, if you're watching a video, you can refer back to it. So um, yeah, so I'll just read this part. I think the formula might be interesting as it only involves just the P of N is the nth partition number. This is the number of ways that you can split the number N into, into parts. Is everyone here at least familiar? Okay. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so then this slide just basically says what we just talked about. This V sub n is the interesting set. Uh, so first I'm going to talk about monoid representations, which is how I ended up doing this thing. And then I'll talk about um, idempotence, which is sort of really what it's about. And uh, finally, I'll show how you can use Burnside's lemma to derive this from just some relatively elementary uh, combinatorics. And then uh, finally, if we have time, I'll speculate about what the implications of this are and remind you that I'm gonna look into it more. Okay. So uh, the way that this got started is that I was interested in representations of monoids. And so I assume everyone knows what monoid is. And uh, representation is uh, just some monoid homomorphism from your given monoid, say A, into uh, into some, um, well, okay. So for me, a set representation, I guess I'll say this, is a monoid homomorphism into um, T of X, where this is the full transformation monoid on the set X. In other words, it's a homomorphism into the monoid whose uh, elements are functions from the set S X to itself, and uh, the identity is the identity function, and the operation is composition. And so uh, this is sort of the, <laughs> Over a field with one element notion of a representation, or in other words, it's it's an action, it's an action of the monoid on the side. Um, so the reason why uh, I actually wanted to do this, this this is sort of a, a lie that I wanted to study monoid representation theory. There was something actually a little bit different 
that I was interested in, but that's going to be a good enough explanation for this talk. And uh, I was really interested in understanding how many different representations there were in some sense. And that sense is that if we have, uh, well, if we have the uh, permutation group uh, sigma of x, maybe I won't give it a bold if I'm saying sigma is an element of it. Uh, well, this group is going to, uh, is of course going to act on, uh, is going to act on the set x, but we can actually upgrade that to an action on the set of all representations of the monoid that we're interested in, which I might call R A of X. So if we have the set of all possible homomorphisms like this, then there is an action of the symmetric group on X on these. And it's just like the same way in maybe the familiar representation theory of groups, the general linear group acts on representations of your group on your vector space. Because, uh, well, we could just define, we could just define rho uh, to the sigma of little a to just be uh, sigma rho of little a sigma inverse. And remember, this is, this is a function from x to itself because rho of little a is a function from x to itself. And I can compose with sigma and sigma inverse because it's actually a permutation. And so I think, uh, I had a slide to this effect next, so that's good for people watching at home. Uh, so we have this action of the permutation group on the set of representations or on the set of actions, which maybe is a little more psychologically stressful to think about the action on the set of actions. So think of them as representations. That was my original motivation anyway. Um, but okay, so we always have that. And then uh, the monoid that I'm interested in, and this is actually, a somewhat degenerate case of this, but I just wanted to share how I actually um, came across it. I'm not interested in just a general monoid. I'm interested in the free item identipotent, identipotent, either way, monoid on a single generator. And so that's what uh, in the paper I call B. And so uh, if, if M denotes the free monoid on a set, I want the free monoid on this set. And then I want to quotient out by the congruence determined by identifying uh, x, x squared uh, with x. And so this is not very exciting. Uh, if you take equivalence classes, this is just this. Is just this. Okay. Uh, so uh, again, I'm kind of hiding my motivations because otherwise this is a pretty degenerate use of this notion. And I could have just started talking about item points immediately. Um, but maybe at the very end, I'll also mention that it's interesting to think about what would this formula be like if instead of using this monoid, I used a different one that was similar to it, um, because then there would presumably be a related formula. Yep. Yeah. So just for uh, a question about your notation. So your x squared and x, so this means you're identifying x squared with x, right? Yeah. I see. Yeah. So that's that's a quotient. So okay. so there is some some monoid congruence that is determined by that and and the least such congruence okay, okay. is the quotient that makes that makes this thing. Okay. And so uh okay, so we have that and uh it's just this two element monoid, kind of a silly case, but even the silly special case already gives us this pretty neat formula with uh partitions. So uh well uh as I said on the slide here, a representation of, of B then is basically uh, just the choice of uh, an identity map. Here, I'll change all my A's to P's. It's just a choice of, uh, well, I guess I'll leave it little a, why not? Um, it's just a choice of an identity map from X to itself because, well, the identity, if it's gonna be a monoid homomorphism, we would have to have that any representation of B would have to have just row of E is just the identity on X uh, and then, we would have to have the row of uh, what I called X. Oh, that's confusing. Well, it's a different X. It's capital X. Apologies. I haven't yet been put through um, rep reading on this, so my notation is terrible at this point. Um, but okay, so row of little X is just going to be some some F from the set big X to itself, and uh, well. In order for this to actually be a homomorphism, the composite of f with itself has to just be f. 
So in other words, F is just an identity map from X to itself. And of course, uh, that means that this set of representations, if you want to think of it that way, is actually in by natural bijection with just the set of all of all self maps of X that have the F composed of F as itself. Okay. And so uh, so then we have a natural action of the symmetric group on that. I could have actually just started with that, but I thought I would actually say at least a little bit about why I was motivated to do this in the first place. It wasn't to find this formula. Um, but, okay. And so uh, now what I'll need, and maybe I will actually try to get the camera, get the camera on the, on some part of the board here for this. Uh, in case you are not really familiar or have never really thought about like what item foot maps on a set look like, they always look like this. Uh, if these, uh, if these points, are all of the elements of my set, then every identity map looks like uh, some things that are in its image. So maybe this is the image of F. This entire thing is that set big X. And then, and then uh, what this looks like is that each of these elements just gets mapped to itself or fixed in other words. And then each of these uh, things in the image has some pre-image, which consists of some set of uh, points in your original set that I'll just get mapped to it. Every, every identity function on a set, and I'm only going to think about finite sets in this talk, I guess that maybe was somewhat guessable from the fact that I was going to talk about partitions, but um, at least for finite sets, let's not think about the infinite case, although it's quite similar. For finite sets, there's always just some finite set of outputs. And then every output has just some collection of elements that are being mapped to it. Okay. And so uh, so then we have the symmetric group acting on this. And uh, the entire idea behind this formula is just basically that, uh, well, what does the action look like? If we can understand, if we can understand the uh, the stabilizer of any of these any of these idempotent functions under this action, then we can apply Burnside's lemma to count the number of orbits. But what we're going to see is that the number of orbits must be the nth partition number. And so if we can compute the size of the stabilizer subgroups for every single f, then we can write down a formula using Burnside's lemma that involves the partition number. And that's that's that formula. And so, uh, well, what is the group action going to do to this? We have each of these little you know, these little stars or bouquets or whatever. And if a particular element in the image of F um, has a certain number of things in its pre-image, well, either the action can permute those things amongst themselves. These three can be permuted amongst themselves or these five can be permuted amongst themselves. Or if there was another little star or bouquet or whatever you like that also had say three things, then you could also swap those two. And so uh, as you might guess, if you're familiar with these sorts of, of groups, that means that all of the stabilizer subgroups are going to be wreath products of symmetric groups. And we can compute their sizes because those are things that are relatively easy to figure out what size they are. Okay, so maybe I'll go forward on the, the slides here. Um, yeah, so I said uh, on the slides something slightly different, but it is very related to what I just said. Uh, so. We can actually um, we can actually define a function, uh, which maybe I'll write over here. We can define a function, uh, which I called um, which I called eta, and so uh, eta of x uh, I define to be the set of all. How did I say this? Yeah, y in the image of f with the same size for image. So the pre-image of the size of the pre-image of X is the same as the size of the pre-image of Y. And so um, if I have anything that's in the that's in the image of F, so this maps this maps the image of F to subsets. to subsets of X. So this is just saying, well, I want to be able to talk about all of the all of the uh, the outputs that have the same little 
little bouquet of uh, elements getting mapped to them here. They have the same pre-image or the same size pre-image, I should say. Uh, so we have that. And then, uh, well, now I can actually, now I can actually describe in terms of this, what the, uh, what the reads product is that, uh, that um, gives us the stabilizer for F. So, uh, so I will, I will do that more explicitly, I suppose. Um, in the actual preprint that's online right now, which is basically just whatever I wrote when I was starting grad school with very little modification. It just took forever to post it. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't actually even, I didn't even, I don't think I even said like, this is a Reese product. I realized it at the time, but I had actually, you know, explicitly written out what it looks like in order to show that it was. So then I just figured, well, what difference does it make? I just care about how big it is. And so, um, Okay, so then I want to I want to uh, take some um, I want to take some set U that belongs to the image of of eta. So in other words, this this U is the set of is a set of these elements in the image of F, which all have the same size pre-image, so they're allowed to be swapped amongst themselves by the uh, the action of the symmetric group, and so then, um, so then for my uh, my group that I'm going to call A sub U, I'm going to uh, take that to be uh, the pre-image. So I'm going to take that to be. Uh, oh, maybe I no 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 I did I didn't mean I didn't mean that. So it's it's a. Uh, Going to be the pre-image of um, of some. It's going to be the pre-image of some uh, some representative x of u uh, without. Oh, I see. That's why there's just a typo or something didn't parse correctly. A sub u is the symmetric group on the pre-image of some representative that we chose. Uh, arbitrarily from U uh, without U itself. Okay. In other words, it's just a symmetric group whose size is the number of things in the pre-image, not including the actual thing in the image of F. And so then, uh, and so then similarly, and apologies to people watching on, on Zoom or on the video, I have to correct that typo on the slides, which I'll post later. Uh, and so then, uh, I want to take H sub U to be the uh, action of, uh, or to be the symmetric group on just U itself. And so, uh, and then I'm going to define uh, finally, okay, I think maybe uh, we can remember what that is now. Then finally, we're going to define K, uh, KU to be. Uh, so a yeah a u, and then to the u's power by which I mean you know take take a direct product of copies of a u indexed by the elements of u, then I can define an action of this on this, and it's the natural action that comes from what I just described before. Uh, so I can define uh, this alpha uh, from um, H U to K U. Okay, well, I guess a homomorphism from this to this is what I want to say. I guess as an action would be well, an action of this on this set. And so that formula is the one um, that you would guess. And so it's alpha, so alpha of H has to eat, uh, well, so something in here is a permutation of U, and then it has to, so something in here is a permutation of U, and then it has to, um, hmm, yeah, no, it's it's because my my bold sigmas didn't, didn't, didn't parse correctly, and that's why, that's why I confused myself. 
So, uh, or maybe just my bold things in general. So what I meant is the, I thought this was an action that was bothering me. Um, okay, so it's actually gonna give us an automorphism as it should of this, of, well, of that group or of, of in other words, KU. So it is an action of this on, on this, my apologies. Okay, so this has to eat a, a sequence of elements of uh, this group AU, and it has to give me another such sequence. And so if you feed in uh, a sequence of AU with little u's in u, then you should get out something which is going to bump into my drawing over here, but we probably can remember that at this point. Then, uh, well, what do we want to do? So uh, H is a permutation of U, and these uh, these guys are indexed by U's. So, well, what is a natural thing that we can do? We can apply H to each of the indices and make another such sequence. Yeah. So that's an action. That's an action of H U on K U. Yeah. Yeah, because the definition of your eta is actually kind of like it's it, it's it's not that easy perhaps. Can you actually illustrate a concrete example on a concrete F? So starting with some concrete F, and then you pick like uh, something in the image that yeah. show you show all oh, what all these guys are. I think that's the. Well, yeah, okay. I can I can do I can. Just yeah, yeah, I can I can do a small example in this part. Okay, so uh, the easiest the easiest possible non-trivial case is is probably well. Okay, let me do slightly less than completely trivial so that it's not degenerate. Uh, let's say that there are two things in the image. So let's say that the image consists of, I don't know, A1, A2, this is B1, B2, B3, C1, C2, C3, right? So the image of F, this is the image of F. Uh, this, these arrows are indicating the, the map and then A1, A2 get sent to themselves. Mm -hmm. And so then, uh, so then this map eta is sending everything in the image of F to the set of all things that have the same size pre-image. So eta is only defined on A1 and A2. Eta of A1 is the set consisting of A1 and A2. Mm -hmm. Eta of A2 is the set consisting of A1 uh, and A2. So it's just saying all of the all of the rip, all of the uh, output elements corresponding to these little stars that have the same size little little stars. Okay. okay. And so then, so then this AU, uh, in this case, well, there's only there's only one one choice of one choice of U, and so that choice would be A one A two. And so then, this AU is it's permuting it's per, so just choose a representative. Let's just choose. Let's just choose my my little x u to be uh, a one. Why not? And then and then this is saying once you've chosen a representative uh, that belongs to you, then look at the group of permutations of all of the stuff in its little bouquet that's not the output element itself. So then this a u would in this case be like. So this in this example this would be like. This would be like sigma b1, b2, b3. Okay, so this means actually you are, so it should be backslash, not slash. Slash means quotient, right? You are actually oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what sense of quotient make there. So, yeah. Okay. Does anyone else have any other questions, or do you want to see the rest yeah, of the Yeah, let's see the rest of the things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. But sigma u is simply going to be like uh the a one is the trivial symmetric group on the one element, right? Um, sigma. Uh, H u h u. Oh h u. Yeah. So the permutations of u. So u itself has oh, two al two elements. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it would be the permutations of those because mm -hmm. then what that's saying is this is the way that you can swap those like those ba base points, the output elements, and then this is the way that you can permute their their little leaves that they have. Okay. And so, um, you know, so this is then a pretty canonical example of a wreath product where then you have you have this H U swapping 
this action is going to just be swapping the the two components and then the um the elements of um of of ku right these are permutations of the little leaves so that would be like sigma 3 okay so yeah so like this is an act this is then an action of like of like sigma 2 on sigma 3 okay um yeah and so uh, once you are given that action, then, uh, well, you can define the multiplication in the natural way that gives you a wreath product. Um, I can write it down if people want explicitly. Do we feel, do we feel neutral instead? Okay. I'll write down the formula, but it's the, it's the, it's the, uh, the natural formula that gives you a wreath product. So, uh, so really, there are some of these products, right, in general, because the, the size of the image of these fixed points so it splits the, the function into oh. sets only the, the permutations of the uh, test blocks. Right? Well, yeah, I mean, but then, okay, I mean, I guess either way, right, because then it's still, it's still a wreath, it's still a wreath product. It's... Uh, but the, different, the sizes of those symmetric groups are different, but they depend on the size of the frame. Oh, right. Sorry. That's actually exactly what I'm saying. It's the stabilizer. So yeah, so this, right. So uh, for this specific F, yeah, I was, I was just being confused. No, you're right. So for this specific F, it is a, wreath, yes. it is a wreath product, but then this, the, um, no, no, what am I, what am I trying to say? So uh, it is a wreath product for, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you get one of these for each U in the image eta. That's what I want to say, right? So that's that's the thing that's a wreath product. The stabilizer is then a product of wreath products, and that's what I have in the next slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, um, okay, so yeah, I mean, okay, people feel very neutral about whether I write down the actual multiplication rule. It's the, the usual. Okay, okay. Let's go on to something else. So, um, Okay, so that's a wreath product of two symmetric groups. And, and then uh, as Petra was pointing out, then that means the stabilizer of F under this natural action of permutations of X is actually going to be the product over all U in the image of that map eta that I defined of these uh, groups, which I call G sub U. G sub U is just that, that, that wreath product group that's determined by this action. And so, um, okay, so that's the stabilizer. That's the stabilizer of F, and that's like a totally generic construction for any F. It will have different sizes depending on what F is, but it's it's something which is a generic thing. And then uh, once we apply Burnside's lemma, well, first of all, um, okay, so I already put the slide up on the video for anyone following along at home, but um, maybe, you know, maybe I'll go over here. What do uh so what do the orbits of this action of the permutation group on idefinite maps like this look like? Well, uh, if you think about it, if I just draw the the graph that corresponds to this without any without any labelings or anything, right? If I just take the the elements of X and I just choose to okay maybe just imagine that the labels are gone. I choose to suppress that, right? All that I've done is I've partitioned X into a bunch of parts of various sizes. And then this choice of which thing in each of the parts is the output element is really like, you know, it's something that's redundant and you can you can change it by, you can, um, it, you you will get, uh, there is going to be an equivalent, equivalent map in the sense of being a conjugate representation, which has any one of these guys as the output element, because the action of the symmetric group on X is just relabeling all of these things, uh, and so there will be, there will be, um, there will be some, some other, some other guy. Uh, remember, it doesn't have to act as as an isomorphism. It doesn't have to act as an isomorphism between the the maps as functions. It's between the monoid the the monoid representations, and so that's why you're allowed to to move that around. So I, I know that's a little bit maybe a little bit irritating <laughs> to think about, but that's so so that means at the end of the day that the the orbits of this action are just are just exactly 
exactly the, the number of partitions of whatever the size of that is. Um, yeah, so, okay. So then, uh, well, because we have that, the Burnside Islamist says the number of orbits is the average over the size of the group that's acting of the stabilizer of, of, uh, of the sizes of the stabilizers of the elements, right? So this is, oh, one over n. So it's the symmetric group that's acting. So it's one over n factorial times the sum over, well, the things that are in the, the set that's being acted on, right? So uh, so that would be identity maps F, which I called I called the set um, I of X. I now know that that's, that's wrong from the notation that people usually use for the theory of monoids or semi-groups, but I'm just doing it this way now because that's what's in the preprint right now, and I'll fix it when I try to publish this later. Uh, so then I just need to know the size of the stabilizer, the stabilizer for each of those things. And then that's that's the form that's the formula, and so that's so that's that's what this formula is. So now just take the size of x to the n, uh, so that gives us our p of n, our one over n factorial. Oh, sorry, I already did it here. One over n factorial. This n, you're probably sitting there like, where does this n come from? It's the size of x. So just take the size of x to the n, and then uh, that's where our one over n factorial is coming from too, and uh, I have to explain to you then what this summation is because it's not just the summation over over identity functions. That's you know that, that wouldn't be as interesting. And so, uh, well, what it basically boils down to is that if I can um, not just figure out the size of the stabilizer for each f, but figure out how many identity maps f have have a stabilizer that's that size, then I can actually write down a sum summation over, over the equivalence classes of such maps by the ones that have the same stabilizer, the same size stabilizer, right? I can just count how many have the same size stabilizer. And then uh, and then I can just sum over whatever that, you know, that natural notion of, of equivalence is, and I can get a formula. And so, uh, so the idea is that is then that um, that uh, so then the idea is that I want to sum over identity maps which um, which induce uh, which induce partitions that have that have the same counts for the number of parts, and so that's basically summing over the set of partitions, which is where which is why I said like this is still cheating a little bit, right? Um, but uh, I don't think that it's totally obvious necessarily because it doesn't seem like something that you would just be able to, you know, I don't know, write down off the top of your head that this these numbers are clearly the same. And so, um, yeah, maybe for the sake of time, I won't go through the actual counting, but you can you can do this counting. And so, what this v sub n is, this is just this is just saying. Um, G is uh, is is a valid um, is a valid assignment of um, of sizes between one zero and n uh, to the number of parts that have that size. So that's not the same as the partition itself. It's very similar though. So G, in other words, you know. So for this for this one right here, you might have like G of so G of, um, okay, well, I guess we're not gonna have zero, apologies, so not zero, but G of one, uh, G of one is zero, uh, G of two is also zero, G of three um, is zero, and G of four is two. In other words, this is like the partition, this is like the partition four plus four of eight. And, and so you could sum over all such maps, and that's what these G's are that that actually give you a valid possible count of the sizes of the parts for a partition of n, um, and then if you sum over those maps with these terms, so this would then be the product of this the size of the stabilizer with the with the number of f's that have that that partition that count of the number of parts that they have, 
Um, and so then that's that's what this formula is. That's where this is coming from. And so uh, just to just to maybe close it out, I'll say uh, so I um, so I showed this to a bunch of people when I was in grad school, and including my advisor, you know, and and they they were all kind of like, you know, yeah, that might be interesting. Don't know. It's not really it's not really my my thing, you know. Um, but uh, it might be interesting, possibly. And then, you know, and then I kind of lost interest in it and was busy doing other things. Um, and so, so uh, then this past summer, I was just talking to people about different things at this REU. I was back in Rochester helping out uh, with running this uh, REU. And, uh, and there were people who were interested and I was like, okay, I should, I should post it, you know, um, I should really post it. And so I did. And uh, I was contacted by a grad student who um, gave me some helpful information and I need to follow up and reach out to the more senior person that he pointed me to. Um, one thing worth noting, which he pointed out as well, is that uh, this is expressing the partition number as some kind of average. So there might be a nice probabilistic way of thinking about this. Um, what I was more interested in and what the end of the paper was, which I was even thinking about at the time was like, can we somehow remove this set of, of uh, partition of functions determining the number of parts of each size by somehow appropriately summing some of these together, right? Or what if I was to just extend this to all functions from the set one through n to the valid number of possible sizes or something along those lines? Could I still actually interpret that as maybe some formula involving the P, P of n now because I... Uh, I at least have this to start off with. And so I messed around with it a little bit and you can see at the end of the paper. And of course I didn't obtain a formula that eliminated this or else, you know, I'm sure people would be way more excited about it. But uh, still I haven't happened to ever see anything like this. And even somebody who was interested in partitions, you know, to a high degree said that he had never seen it either. So um, yeah, hopefully at least this is somewhat interesting. Uh, maybe I'll leave it there. People have any questions? Okay, let's first thank the speaker. Excellent comment. So, you know, it's one of these coincidences. I happen to be working on very similar things uh, with Shu Joy, and we have a big thing now to the drive to see through these things very well now, and I wouldn't if I didn't do that for it. Yeah. So, are you familiar with work with Davis and the Berlin? I mean, I know the name De Bruyne, but okay, I'm yes. not. So there is a. So if you look at just the transformation monoid, so they ask themselves the question: What is the number of equivalence classes, in other words, the number of orbits under the conjugation action of the symmetric group on the on the transformation monoid? Yeah. So that's exactly what you are doing. Except you are restricting to a special case of transformation, which are identical. Yeah. And they developed the formula. I believe the formula has V and in it. Exactly. Oh, okay. It's even the same. Uh, uh, so, uh, but of course, it's for a more general case. So it's not as detailed as yours. It leaves some things that you have to calculate. Uh, because you have all these like trees. Yes, yes. That so the, so the functional, these are functional digraphs. And these functional digraphs mm -hmm. are just a disjoint union of directed trees that end with a directed cycle. Right? Yeah. That, that's how they look like. And, uh, so they have the formula in the paper. The Bruin doesn't explain anything. He just said, hey, I use very sides my mind <laughs> here in <laughs> And then he by hand calculates the first like 10, uh, 10 things. Some people picked it up and evaluated this number. It's called the number of mapping types up to n equals 1,000 using computers. So, and, and it's posted in the online Wikipedia. Oh, cool. In the sequence. So what uh, Sugar and I did was we needed from a problem in the multi homology and topology to find minimal representatives of these uh, equivalence classes. So we posted a paper that has a quadratic time algorithm for finding a minimal representative for any of these functional diagrams. Yeah. It would apply to your case here. And I think that's another way of uh, counting because you can see how many things are mapped onto the same minimal representative. So uh, somehow it's gonna be equivalent we didn't ask ourselves for this item put in case at all, so I can yeah. think about that. But I think of uh, thinking about the minimal representation might be helpful. 
this conference too. So the preprint is on my website. We submitted it to some of forum. It got a positive review, but they wanted some things to mention. So we, it is now an updated version. And we have a look. The literature is there. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, if I'm going to try to publish this at some point, I should, I should uh, definitely take a look. I mean, I guess, uh, yeah, so I guess this is at least... I mean, at least it's a little bit different because I did this without without finding a representative, but it's just that if you can figure out what all of the valid such functions are, then you can compute this. Yeah. this and I must say, I looked at the Bruce formula and I did not understand it. I, I mean, it's clear it's from Bird Science, so not because it was this form, yeah. but he doesn't bother to explain anything. I, I think people in the, I, I think this is paper from the 80s, so it's something like the 70s. Uh, they were either much smarter than we are now, <laughs> or, or typing things were more complicated, so they didn't explain things. And uh, so it's, it's a, to me, it's a mysterious formula. So if you could look at this formula and explain it easily, I would be thankful. Yeah, I mean, I definitely remember at least thinking about, you know, of course, there's not anything like especially especially special about this besides that the orbits are naturally like the partition numbers. Yeah. But you know, you could of course do the thing, same thing with general functions, and it, it's. I mean, it, it's got to just be the same. It's got to just be. It's the same. It's it is the same exact. It's the same exact type of thing, where it's just going to be some iterated reads product, yeah. right? Because you just have. I mean, that's basically what it is. It's just an iterated an iterated reads product where you have the permutations of like the. Base points that have the so same, yeah. We do yeah. describe a full automorphism group for any representative in our paper because once you have the canonical labeling, you can really see what the automorphism group is going to be. In other words, what's the stable line. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, I did not think of counting, using it to do the count. Yeah, because then you have to, right, you have, if, you know, then you have to count the number of actual instances that have the same shape, yeah. in other words, and then, and then, you know, yeah. I mean, that's the count. That's that must be the one piece in in Duperin's formula that that is the mysterious one. Is how do you actually count how many copies of that you have? But that also seems like it's not bad, right? Because you just choose you just choose however not however many of these like these um, elements that get mapped to themselves are these like base points, right? And then you just make arbitrary choices of the next level of the tree and the next level of the tree and so on. I looked at it, it looked reasonable. Like, I think I know what he's doing, but because the argument is not there. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit unclear. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that people definitely are interested in this sort of yeah. thing. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'll definitely check out your, your paper. Thanks so much for telling me about it. Okay, any other questions? Um, is it possible to so this is for uh, just usual partitions? Yeah. Um, is it possible to realize uh, point partitions? So oh, these are like partitions <laughs> uh, with boxes, like a three-dimensional version where it's not like a young diagram. You put a line that you put oh. in a corner of a well, I mean like this this formalism. I mean, I guess this was just basically pointed out like this technique is is at least um I mean, as long as you have something discrete anyway, you're going to be able to do something similar. Um, and again, I mean, I guess there's all, there's still the question of like, how interesting is it? Because like, you're going to end up having some complicated expression, but summing over this, this uh, set of functions is going to somehow be the parameterizing the shapes of the objects that you're acting on in the first place, which is very close to knowing the actual objects themselves. But I mean, you conceivably with something discrete could do something analogous. You're just replacing the symmetric group with whatever group you're considering uh, acting with. Well, it's not clear that you can realize any combinatorial count with this formalism. Because at least in this case, it looks like you're counting the forests that have type P in, in these two cases. Um, in general, like, can you give a monoid that would count, for example, point positions? Uh, to me, that's not obvious that that's necessarily possible. So, well, okay. The reason why I said it seems clear that you can do that is just because there's still like par partitions of something, and so like it's not it, it's not the the natural the natural group action would not be very different probably. Is my guess. Yeah, and so I was saying, if it's a discrete thing, then you're going to end up like permuting the labels 
it might change your X, for example. Like, yeah, so to allow it to change your kind of X. So, yeah, the effect yeah. of the, I mean, what makes it more clear when you don't, don't work in this area is that the conjugation action effect is renaming the labels on your graph according to the permutation. That's all that it is. So, so you are really looking at automorphism groups of labeled graphs or of the unlabeled graphs. That's exactly what it is, and it just so happens that it meshes well. Yeah. yeah, and this is actually, in some sense, a degenerate case of this. Actually, it's the it's the fact that you get the part it just partitions and nothing more is actually like in this. Yeah, that's very nice. Like, that's, yeah. a, that's the that's the biggest observation I think that actually these are yeah. partitions which I did not realize until very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you know if you uh if you do enough algebra, even uh, the uh, degenerate case is something interesting. Um, oh yeah, thanks so much. Thanks so much again. Uh, Let us thank the speaker again.